Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to GeoStrata Extra. It is, as you can tell by the sign I'm holding in front of my face right now, Valentine's Day. Thank you for joining us for our first GeoStrata Extra of 2023. This is season four of GeoStrata Extra. Somewhat unbelievably, we have made it here. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and we are thrilled to have you along for the ride today. We will be talking about an article in the brand new issue of Geostrata, the February-March issue. If you do not have it in your mailbox or on your computer screen already, you can do so very simply. Head over to readgeo, spelled just as it sounds, dot com. And you will see all of our issues from the past, I believe six years is what we have up there, can read them all, including the most recent one. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute and you find yourself here today, after you watch this, you should head over to geoinstitute.org. And while you are there, you will learn that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and that we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Also, while you're watching today, you should click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will, of course, dear viewer, let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. With that out of the way, what are we going to talk about today? Geostrata editor Mark Seal is here with us to interview Ingrid Tomac from the University of California, San Diego, one of the authors of an article in the February-March issue about rock mechanics and geoenergy. With that out of the way, Mark, take it away, have fun, good luck. Okay, thanks, Brad, appreciate it. Uh, Ingrid, nice to meet you. Uh, welcome to the current edition of Geostrata Extra. Uh, so all you folks out there, as uh, Brad mentioned, will be speaking today with uh, Dr. Ingrid Tomatsu, who, along with her co-authors, uh, Sungi Kim and Roman Maknenko, uh, I have prepared this article that, that Brad had referenced titled Rock Mechanics for Geoenergy Applications, Energy Extraction and Storage from Below Our Feet. Uh, <clears throat> so as Brad mentioned, please have a, have a check, have a look at that and, and check it out. It's a very interesting article. Um, you know, this is one of those times where we get to explore through the editor's eyes and, and through your eyes as well as you chat in with, with comments and questions. Uh, we get to delve a little bit more deeply into an article and uh, and during the interview. So if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and uh, Brad will get through them and, and send them over to me to 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 ask. Uh, my name is Mark Seal. I've been an editor with uh, Geostratus since 2016, and I'm a principal geotech and uh, geological engineer with Lang and Engineering out of uh, Elwood Park, or excuse me, out of uh, Parsippany, New Jersey headquarters. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it, just a real brief intro on the bio. Ingrid has got uh, uh, nearly 30 years of consulting and research experience, uh, mostly in geomechanics, geothermal energy, rock fracturing, and fluid particle interactions. And along with her co-authors, they have a varied uh, amount of experience in, in related uh, sciences. So uh, again, welcome Ingrid to Geostrata. And uh, you know it's it's an interesting you 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 and your your co-authors have tackled a very challenging and complex subject for your article, and kind of from a thirty thousand foot view or vantage point, subject involves traditional rock mechanics and and geotechnics, but it's, it's applied at a, a at a much uh, greater depth, which of course makes it more complicated owing to the various chemical and biological and physical and interactions that take place at that depth. Uh, so I'd like to start with. <clears throat> A discussion about the state of practice and research, and then dig a little deeper. Uh, so, so let's start with the first question here. Uh, your article describes the four geoenergy project types: geothermal, hydrogen storage, car carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide sequestration and storage, and then nuclear waste and storage. In your in your view or viewpoint of this, can you rank these different types in terms of the number? of existing large scale installations that are around worldwide. And then secondly, uh, for those that uh, not currently in service, if any, rank them in terms of their maturity relative to resolving the uh, the uh, the relative design and or construction challenges or barriers to development. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you so much. 
for promoting our article. Uh, we are excited to be here. Uh, I mean, I uh, talked a little bit to co-authors yesterday uh, to try to uh, figure out uh, uh, what else can we say and, and convey beyond this article here. Yeah, so uh, we wanted to uh, emphasize these new rock mechanics topics, right, uh, that are emerging and there are so many unresolved issues. Many uh, researchers in US and worldwide are working on these. Uh, so the geothermal, enhanced geothermal energy, hydrogen storage, CO2 sequestration and storage, nuclear waste storage, and also compressed air storage uh, are all uh, uh, deep underground uh, problems, as you said. So for your question in terms of ranking, um, so we discussed how can we rank uh, these four. Uh, and we made uh, the conclusion that actually these are ranked differently in different uh, locations, right? So in the United States, we do have a huge DOE initiative ongoing, FORGE in Utah with the EGS site that is um, now being drilled and fracked. So this is a pilot EGS research site. And then we have some other uh, smaller um, reservoirs. Then for uh, nuclear waste, we are uh, kind of like uh, maybe stop the Yucca Mountain uh, uh, research. So this this one is close, and I think there was another one in uh, Colorado somewhere between Boulder and Golden at some point. And then you can look at the Switzerland and Europe. They are maybe ahead with this type of uh, in situ um, ongoing um, nuclear-based storages. So I'm talking about what is there out out there and not what's in our labs, right? So like many, many papers uh, are coming from lab work. This is a completely different topic. Then uh, hydrogen storage, we have uh, two, three or five um, sites in salt domes in Texas and California in mines. Uh, then um, uh, we don't have any silent aquifer aquifers yet. Uh, and then hydrogen storage has been picking up uh, Department of Energy attention and also industry attention lately. We are trying to decarbonize uh, the hydrogen uh, extraction and storage, right? So. Uh, Hydrogen is used in transportation and industry um, production of fertilizers, uh, in oil production and so on. And it is uh, expensive to uh, extract, like to get it uh, in industrial processes. So uh, there is big interest how to store it and reuse it. So now we we have some, some ongoing efforts there. Um, then, uh, yeah, CO2 sequestration is a big topic, but I think geothermal and CO2 sequestration are also uh, popular in, in Europe. Geothermal is very, very popular in Germany. Uh, and for US, we are kind of uh, uh, just looking at what are what are the like the the, the government uh, people uh, uh, preferences and government initiatives and now just looking at the Department of Energy as maybe the leading uh, um, effort or funding source, you can maybe get better idea of what is going on right there. Um, so so I would uh, uh, geothermal I would rank that that Europe is really. Uh, picking up, and maybe geothermal is the most mature, right? But for the CO2 uh, uh, sequestration and storage, there is an overlap between CO2 and geothermal energy. So these days now, um, many researchers are looking, including myself, how to further utilize CO2 um, for uh, geothermal reservoirs, right? So we can inject CO2 and uh, some, there were, Previously, a uh, uh, lot of publications how to frag with CO2. Now we can um, 
maybe extract the geothermal heat using the C CO2, right? So that uh, technologies are overlapping. For uh, compressed air energy storage, uh, this is also something that is picking up and relatively new, right? So in uh, terms of uh, um, monies and uh, 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 number of, of those sites, I don't have a good answer, but I would say like geothermal e EGS pilot sites, there were like seven or eight, uh, even five, six years ago when I finished my PhD and when I started because I did work on that, to on this topic, um, you must not forget Australia, uh, they have EGS, uh, Sultz is producing energy, then uh, Hungary and Turkey as well uh, have some EGS efforts in France, Germany and so on. So uh, in England, yeah, and there is a big, um, I think, Asian um, countries that I, in China, I don't have a good overview what are they're doing. I do a lot of um, service for uh, journals and we get a lot of papers and I see like there are a lot of sites uh, when they're trying to do EG EGS and CO2 storage, right? So, but I don't know, <laughs> actually, it's a huge country there. It's kind of... Well, you touched, upon, you touched upon some, uh, uh, your answer is really touches upon the, the size and, and, and variability and the types of geoenergy projects that are out there. Uh, and I think that gives us a pretty good good sense of uh, of the the scale of it. Um, you know, as we as I want to dig a little bit deeper then into something, for example, like coupled flow phenomena. It tends to be a complex problem. You know, you also talk about uh, in your article about um, supercritical uh, mm. uh, CO2, for example, and CO, uh, supercritical geothermal systems. Um, can you can you give us a little insight into uh, into the significance of those coupled flows and the in the in the, the nature of uh, the reactions at depth that mm -hmm. cause uh, researchers problem or and or particularly cause uh, practitioners problem or what you see as being potentially hurdles to getting some of these systems across the, the finish line, especially at depth. Yeah, yeah. So we, we wanted to emphasize uh, the, the article because of uh, these problems, and specifically Roman McNinka at the University of Illinois or uh, Urbana-Champaign has a, um, a big and up-to-date lab, and he's working and doing a lot of research in shale, a couple processes for elasticity and uh, chemo, chemo, mechanical processes. So he has. Uh, uh, kind of uh, <laughs> gave his opinion yesterday that uh, it is it is an uh, ongoing problem. We are trying to uh, understand a couple processes. So one parameter is affecting another parameter, and they together they are affecting the system. And there are more parameters that identifying which one are important and which which stage. Uh, so you have the the thermal, the heat flow and transport through fractures in, in porous rock mass. So rock mass has a cross scale damage, which is pores, micro cracks, fractures, or even faults. And then how uh, you, you heat up or cool down everything. So the uh, fluid can flow through it. In EGS, we want to have steam. So now we have thermodynamics inside where the fluid is not Newtonian anymore and it's not incompressible anymore. Right? So he is just saying we are trying to um, establish analytical models and then validate it in a small scale in the lab. And then we see that some things don't match. So we are improving the models and then the analytical models would be something that is uh, a background for implementation in large scale numerical models which practitioners can use. So it's an uh, ongoing uh, struggle and you can see really a lot of journal papers, right? So and then uh, the, the other problem is that we have different uh, rock types. So there is this across scale problem, just the geometry scale and then the time scale. Some processes are fast. So heat uh, diffusion is could be characterized as slow. Heat convection is fast. 
you're trying to pump something through the fracture, through the rock mass. Yeah, and then if you have a sandstone and a limestone, like in a, the dolomite and siltstone shale, granite, we're basically dealing with different materials, right? So like you're dealing with like a block of concrete and a sponge, <laughs> You know, something like that. So, so that, that's an so, interesting point. Yeah, You've yeah. got competing scales uh, and competing parameters that uh, that make the analytical development of analytical models very challenging. Yeah. Um, it, it, that kind of dovetails into to another another question having to do with the types of investigation or testing that that could be done to you know to determine or verify rock material properties. And flu, you know, other fluid material properties at those depths, and uh, which I'm understanding from your response to the last question is what you need to really validate uh, your analytical models. Do you have any? Uh, have you seen any uh, any, any uh, methods in particular that have been adopted for uh, you know for testing that that you think are showing promise or are helpful in 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 your work uh, developing your models? Yeah, I mean it. So this is uh, something that is uh, what would I say is evolving uh, would be small scale testing in labs. So now we can really look at a very very small scale of some of these interesting fundamental uh, coupled processes in a nano scale and going from X ray or even like a psych psychotron uh, facilities. Um, that are shared facilities uh, uh, managed by government. And then uh, in, in the lab, now we need to build right high stress, high temperature triaxial cells, true triaxial cells, in situ stress, in rock, we know it's uh, all three principal stresses are important. So now the, the lab uh, has to uh, uh, match these and then you can go a little bit larger than a small triaxial specimen that is maybe 50 centimeter or a meter where we can have at least a little bit of existing fractures. So this dual system of porous rock mass and fractures. So in Germany, when I was a postdoc there a couple of years ago, uh, then what I'm saying is the German government is very generous and there was a 1.6 million euros grant awarded and at first submission attempt to build a large scale through triaxial test uh, testing system for high stress high temperature for the geothermal and actually it's still not completely installed right so we have uh, fibers optic sensors that can measure temperature and uh, strain these are new um, in when when uh, you drill then there is uh, this uh, from oil and gas adopted the drilling oil um, so there is, there would be a, a borehole logging, right? And then we take samples out and bring them to the lab. Um, geophysical methods are picking up. I'm not an uh, expert on these as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, so the combin. Oh, we always have combination of in, in situ and lab testing, like we do in geotechnical engineering. Typically, but uh, now we need to deal with high stresses and high temperatures. And these are off shelves, like triaxial tests, maybe now, you know, by MTS and some other. I'm not going to advertise here. We all know what are those uh, companies that make lab equipment, right? Sure. But there are custom ones as well. And you can see different uh, researchers across the country. Like I can, I, obviously Derek Hillsworth lab, I think, you know, the, we built our uh, setups in the end of the day to study this one particular uh, piece of puzzle um, <laughs> to, to, to solve the big problem, right? So, right. yeah. Um, just want to come back briefly to, so that you, you, in your article, you called out the high enthalpy supercritical geothermal. I guess one question is, could you just define for for our listeners what what does that mean, supercritical, and uh, explain how do we either capture it from the atmosphere or uh, what is the other what other sources would you the yeah, so, use from? You, you, yeah, so the, uh, I mean uh, carbon dioxide uh, within this 
ongoing decarbonization initiatives um, needs to be removed from the atmosphere due to the global warming and so on. So um, we, uh, uh, as as we discussed yesterday, I think that there are some uh, some companies are developing. Um, technologies that would extract it from the atmosphere CO2, but this is not uh, really, you know, everyday uh, uh, business, uh, but then uh, it, uh, factories are getting incentives uh, to capture and then they capture 80 um, or even above 90 percent of their um, whatever they would exhaust in the atmosphere now through some filters right and then uh, the co2 can be stored in tanks and uh, then later compressed and injected into subsurface and we just use the supercritical as you know, the state which is at high stress and compressed basically um, increased temperature so we have uh, more uh, the liquid for a uh, supercritical is not liquid it's that like three the point <laughs> in the face diagram and we uh, then in inject this into the subsurface and another thing is that you would uh, basically have high stresses already a uh, few kilometers underground so this supercritical co2 has to uh, be um, as well in a similar pressure right state uh, it is more less viscous, so flows better. And then now, what we are trying to uh, accomplish is to um, inject uh, for uh, permanent um, storage into, into ground where CO2 gets chemically bonded to rock minerals. So, the, so the intent so, is there. The intent there is that you you're injecting a fluid that is. Uh, in a in a pressure and temperature state that's closer to the the uh, conditions where at the injection site, which presumably then uh, ease or or reduce the number of uh, potential conflicts between the physical chemical processes that are that are going on. Yeah, generally. Okay. Um, so in. Uh, so just I guess coming coming back around to kind of a the, the practice side of it, I think a lot of the what you're doing obviously is on the research side, and you've you've identified some of the programs or <clears throat> or the number of different types of these programs that are uh, and practices that are that are out there, but probably in more of a less advanced stage than than we'd like them to be. Uh, what do you see as the uh, you know based on what you've discussed so far, what do you see as one or two of the top geoenergy solutions that could be, could have the highest impact over the shortest amount of time? Hmm. I guess another way to look at it is uh, what's, what's, what's really the closest in your estimation to, to taking off? We know that geothermal uh, is probably one of the more mature um, is the world close and uh, from what you can see it to getting there as far as pushing you know any one of these technologies forward or is that still something that needs is in development oh i've seen a lot of uh, solutions for co2 storage and there are some sites like in israel and i think in norway that and some others are opening now by getting established so uh, I think that the CO2 storage is close to, you know, being utilized um, effectively in a in a term in terms that we can how much we can capture that we can also store. Uh, yeah, I think that the geo with the EGS enhanced geothermal systems we do have some challenges uh, that are more. Um, th there is very different rock. Right, so for fracking, uh, and then some fracking is uh, causing those little earthquakes. We, we've seen this in Basel uh, a few years ago as well. So the DOE is pushing for, for geothermal a lot. If, if, the, if, there, if there is a fast breakthrough uh, of 
some key problems in EGS, then we can also place EGS as smaller power plants anywhere um, in any location. So you would be automatically getting electricity out of ground. This is uh, sustainable and renewable, uh, and that would be good. Uh, I see that hydrogen storage has also many ideas, but maybe like yeah, geothermal would be number one and the CO2 number two, and then maybe hydrogen compressed air. And the nuclear waste storage is, um, yeah, th there are definitely sites uh, that work. I just don't, uh, it's, it's kind of like, in my opinion, nuclear waste, as much waste as you have, is uh, gonna be stored, but maybe uh, it's not gonna so directly impact um, the, the atmospheric and this decarbonization um, that we, we need to, to do. And now you need to look at the world kind of stage. So like G7 and there is some uh, uh, recent initiatives that uh, are trying to kind of bring all these technologies to developing countries. So, um, so which one can be actually like down so that we actually cover uh, the whole globe with, with less CO2 in the atmosphere? It's a, it's a very, very hard question. I probably don't have a good answer, uh, you know, here. From well, I, know. yeah. <laughs> Well, it's probably is uh, there's as many answers as there are people weighing in on it, right? And uh, you, also in your article, you'd mentioned um, energy piles and tunnel facings, pavements. Can you just uh, go into that a little bit? Describe for our listeners what uh, you know, <laughs> what they are, the advantages, or how it's being applied currently, and and what those advantages are to us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. I, I would dare to say this is like a mature mature field, and I don't know how much uh, we we use it in the United States. Not enough, probably. But uh, when I talk to like the for the energy piles, the the pioneers, uh, you know, Professor Brandel in Austria, and uh, uh, Dietrich Adam is also now head of the ge geotechnical group in uh, Vienna University. And I talked to them in person, like even like five, ten years ago, they're like saying, oh, we've installed thousands and thousands of meters of energy piles under every building in Austria and in tunnels, in, in Alps. Uh, so this is a very clear uh, technology, I think, that just needs to be applied. I think it's matured and John McCartney is also done a lot of work and pioneering this in the United States as well, but that was like 15 years ago, maybe, uh, when he started. So uh, the the idea is to uh, use the constant temperature of the ground that is shallower, at shallower depths, and then seasonally um, utilize the energy, thermal energy through some um, heat, uh, heat pumps, for cooling of buildings and heating of buildings and green gases. And then you can um, basically uh, uh, use these uh, uh, line uh, uh, door systems in tunnels or uh, diaphragm walls, uh, any kind of shallow deep foundations. Um, people use those uh, uh, thermal energy also for um, the icing of uh, roads in colder areas, and then on the level of uh, single households, they are very um, good for um, just heating in all these cold regions in the United States, where now plumbers are installing those uh, in North Dakota, where we go for family <laughs> visit, they have them there, and it's very good heat, <laughs> and very cheap heat, yeah. Indeed, it is. Uh, and you make a great point about the, the, the it being fairly mature. There are, as you pointed out, thousands of, of meters of, of these types of systems installed. It's basically, at this point, if it's not already installed, it would be the heat pump, that is, would be a retrofit application. But there's also tremendous benefit under new installations is uh, what you're, I think it sounds like what you're promoting as well. You know, yeah. under the construction scenarios. Yeah, I think that new constructions could all have it. Uh, 
I think it's uh, so from what I heard in like talking to European colleagues, it is always everything is, is driven by public opinion and then the government uh, uh, incentives like same as we have for solar here in California. So uh, uh, in Germany, the public really loves renewables and geothermals, you know, and they're they are putting a lot of um, people are very happy and the government is supporting basically listening to, to people and they put a lot of money into all kind of incentives. So now and then then what I hear from Songi yesterday is that, for example, in Nebraska, he's trying to collaborate with a company who is doing some CO2 secret storage, sequestration storage, and like EPA uh, is such a big problem. They don't see a resolution in, in their uh, trying to get some permits, right? So, so yeah. Uh, that okay. there could be could be some civil engineering uh, civil engineering kind of uh, uh, going to government as we do and pointing to some some obstacles so that companies can actually uh, do more. Sure. So in other words, incentive incentivization always is a benefit <laughs> for uh, trying to move along a, a, a technology. Um, so uh, one one question that I came up in my mind as you're describing some of what you're discussing, you talked about the salt mining and and uh, what is it if you if you know what is the uh, when they when that type of dissolution is done they bring it to the surface uh, the brine it do you, I mean, we can imagine what they do with it. Do you know what they do with the brine at the surface? And is that, in your estimation, sustainable considering the volume that would be required for any you know, large scale commercial application of a, of a, a brine op or a salt mine operation? But I mean, as, as far as I know about brine, it's too that they have a lot of byproduct of brine that they reject, right? So then we had also Oklahoma earthquakes couple of years ago, but yeah, I, I kind of didn't get any opinion of on, on that. And, and so so mm. that brings up another point, and you, something you said earlier I want to link it to, is you talked about the, the injections, whether it's brine or whether it's another super critical fluid. Uh, there are these, especially in fractured media, that you get these slippage and you get these relatively smaller Earthquakes, which has been documented for decades, I think. Um, do you do you do you sense in in your research that that is uh, something that's kind of constraining development of some of these technologies, where the fear of you know, uh, earthquakes that result from the injections is something meaningful to to regulate? No, I mean I think the general consensus uh, among uh, you know rock mechanicians is that it's not. A problem, uh, but we need to know what we're doing, and there is research ongoing. Uh, there is a big fear in public com that comes from ignorance of, you know, just uh, uh, specific <laughs> things uh, that that people don't know, and uh, this can affect then again some regulation agencies and, and government and uh, you, you can have uh, obstacles to actually uh, implement fracking technology. And I think, yeah, this is like also what I've heard in different regions and, you know, people don't allow it like Switzerland. So I don't think it's a technical question. It's more uh, the, the question of this the fear in public and political question, right? So we wouldn't be, uh, given the the huge amount of research on geophysics and uh, journals and, and papers uh, and experimentation and so on, like we are not so afraid that, you know, that we don't know anything about it and like um, that we wouldn't like frack at all, right? Yeah. So I, I, I've got one more one more question for you, but I also wanted to remind our listeners, please, if you have any questions, start sending them in through the chat bar as we'll uh, we'll be wrapping up uh, 
the next several minutes. So please get those questions in. Um, so my question is really kind of a, a softball. Is there anything else that you really that coming out of that article that you uh, or, or related to it that you any message or point that you wanted to make here uh, while we're discussing the article? Hmm. So all my questions so far have hit the mark for you. I mean, if, if, there, if there's something else that uh, you felt was you know, worth worth uh, embellishing on, you know, please. Well, I, I would invite people to, to read the article. We, we tried to, you know, uh, emphasize the most important uh, things. And we also would, you know, the article is not the, the answer. It's a lot of questions. So we try to uh, show people where is the current knowledge standing and uh, what are some uh, challenges for for uh, researchers or maybe there are some directions. Uh, I think that, yeah, uh, we do have uh, startups and uh, a different initiatives from our classical uh, academia and uh, national labs. So maybe uh, we would encourage encourage in individuals who aspire to uh, to do business to to start also maybe read and see maybe they can you know do the hydrogen storage. I mean there there is there is this geothermal and I don't want to advertise again, but in, in geothermal. There are a couple of, of startups. They have a very uh, millions of dollars of uh, government money or uh, these uh, kind of like uh, communities or little cities. And they're installing geothermal with, with, uh, with companies who are doing it. So they're overseeing it. So there could be also boost from industry to uh, so there's some forward. out there that are uh, that are taking advantage of some of the government subsidies to uh, help push this along. The DOE is, is is funding those companies as, as well as they're funding national labs and uh, universities as well. Yeah. Well, got it. Okay. All right. Um, well. So I'm going to, uh, so Ingrid, so far I've got no questions coming in. Okay. Um, so, uh, but there's still an opportunity. The link stays live for quite some time. So if anything comes in and people do have questions, we'll be sure to forward them over to you and then we can make those available to to the listeners uh, uh, at a later date. Yeah, uh, we, yeah, I will be happy to answer. And also Roman and Songi are uh, there as well. Fantastic. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for, first of all, for your article and your co-authors, as well as your time here today to uh, to answer these questions and, uh, and enlighten us on some uh, insights about your article. So thanks yeah. very much. Yes, thank you. And happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Yes, have some so chocolate. Thanks, we'll thanks do. for joining us, all of our viewers out there. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Ingrid, for a great article and a great interview. We really appreciate it. We're very proud of Geostrata. Again, as I said at the beginning, if you haven't checked it out, make sure you head over to readgeo.com. You can look at back issues there, read the current issue. If you're not a member, maybe it will inspire you to head over to geoinstitute.org and join up today. Our next live stream will be one week from today. It will be our Geo Congress sneak preview number four, and it will be Tim Stark and Demetrios Zekos talking about the Rat Creek landslide failure on Route 1 in Central California. Uh, so we'd love to have you. Again, same place, our YouTube channel, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern. Geostrata Extra will be back in two months for the next issue. And for all of our viewers, thanks for being with us, and we will see you again soon.